what we set out to do was get a 42 pound IMAX camera to the top of Everest. It was a very risky endeavor. People felt that getting the camera up to the top of the mountain was impossible. The people in the climbing team were shaking hands with death every time they climb a mountain. Getting to the summit is optional, getting down is mandatory. The wind can come up, can get dark, and you're in a snowstorm, you're in a fight for your life. The IMAX guys had come up. I pretty much assembled the dream team of climbing. Well, I don't like climb a route with people dead on the way. I got a call at 1.30 in the morning. Brad said, they've made it, I can't believe it. And I said, oh my God, I, I can't believe it either. You're here, you know, this is it. Uh, I don't think I've ever been that emotional. They had so much courage and perseverance that they willed their way to the top of the mountain. Everest is the top of the world. In 1996, McGillivray Freeman Films set out to take an IMAX camera right to the summit. The thing that is different about IMAX, and for me, that is much more powerful and, and beneficial to the audience, is that they feel like they're in the place that the movie was made because it's wrapping around them. And so I like to give people films that they wouldn't be able to participate in on their own. At McGillivray Freeman, we've made over 20 IMAX films over the past 25 years, more than any other film producer. We've given audiences a vivid sense of what it's like to soar above some of the most dramatic landscapes on Earth. We've gone underwater into the amazing world of our oceans. And we've also taken the IMAX camera inside the human body. About 10 years ago, I was thinking of different subjects to film in IMAX, and Mount Everest was one of the ones that became my most favorite. IMAX is the highest resolution film format in the world, where each frame is literally 10 times larger than 35 millimeter normal motion picture. And the screens they're projected on can be up to seven stories tall. Our idea was to put together a team of mountaineers and have the audience experience through IMAX what it's really like to climb Everest. It seemed crazy, but we wanted to take an IMAX camera, the largest film format on Earth, right to the top of the largest mountain on Earth. The actual IMAX camera that we normally use weighs a little over 100 pounds fully loaded. That was not feasible to take to the top of Everest. So we developed a camera, which we call a lightweight camera, but it actually weighs over 40 pounds when it's fully loaded. It was a very risky endeavor. People basically felt that getting the camera or getting something that big and that heavy up to the top of the mountain was impossible. Normally any camera, even a still camera, a simplified still camera will freeze up and not work. And the IMAX company helped us out an awful lot when we partnered with them to try to uh, design and build this camera that would work in the cold. This is his first test. This camera has never been used before. It was built especially for this expedition and tested down to minus 40 degrees and it absolutely worked flawlessly. This camera is remarkable. There's tremendous challenges to this format for me. Uh, I had to rethink filmmaking. Uh, almost every part of it, the pacing, panning, tilting, uh, action, how fast action can move, where things should be in the frame. David was very open to learning what the fine points are in making IMAX movies. He went to Nepal in 1995 to shoot some IMAX roles and get a feel for it. We hired a writer, Tim Cahill, who came up with a really nice script and then they went off to film it. 
David coupled up with Ed Beesters, who is probably America's finest high-altitude mountaineer at this point, thought to be sort of a superman of mountaineering. We filmed Ed and his wife, Paula, training in Moab, Utah, by mounting an IMAX camera inside a Space Cam helicopter rig. This special gyro-stabilized device gave us steadier and more spectacular aerials than we've ever been able to do before. Ed and Paula were in charge of the expedition logistics, and Ed also helped choose the rest of the climbing team. We wanted to have an expedition where some of the people had never climbed Everest. Everybody that goes to Everest does not always get to the summit, so we wanted that possibility. Mount Everest, towering giant of the Himalayas, waited a million years for a man to conquer her. In 1953, Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary were the first people to reach the summit. Tenzing's son, Jam Ling, was the next person to join our team. It's been my dreams, you know, ever since I was a kid to climb. And more so, I think it's because it's been in my genes. Since my father climbed, I feel the need and urge to climb too. I knew what I was getting with John Ling. You only need to look at his father and look at John Ling and see the similarities. Araceli was an equally easy and obvious choice. There's a lot of people that have climbed these big peaks now, but she was in a different league. Araceli, yeah. so you ready? Yeah. We're gonna put this on you. And on top of that, it only takes being around Araceli for about 10 seconds to realize she's got a really wonderful personality. What I will miss, if I miss something is a bath, but I have not bath at home, then I can miss it. I don't know. Um, maybe if you ask me that when we will be at the base camp, I can tell you better. We had another member from Japan. Sumio, where is this mountain? Sumio Tuzuki. It is Mount Fuji, David. And she was actually a pretty experienced climber, and it was great to have someone from a very different culture, you know, that had a different way of looking at climbing mountains. <laughs> Everest is in the Himalayan range, right on the border between Nepal and Tibet. Our expedition began in Kathmandu, Nepal, where the team arranged for provisions and supplies. The temples in Kathmandu form a spiritual base for the movie. The mountain is Chomolongma. The goddess resides there. You know, I pray every day, pay respects, you know, to the mountain goddess for our safety, you know. Jomulang means uh, goddess mother, Jomulang. And then our respect the mountain. Wang Chu is our Sirdar. He's in charge of all of the Sherpa. He's their boss. And so he and I work very close together. The team had to be sure they had everything they would need to feed and equip over 30 people for two months in the mountains. Once you leave Kathmandu, you, you take off in a vintage Russian helicopter, which is easily the most dangerous part of the whole expedition. These things are held together with chewing gum and bailing wire, so uh, it flies you up into a little town called Lukla, which is spectacular. It's at about 9,000 feet, and there's a huge wall of rock that just juts up into the sky for several thousand feet, and you just go, we're there. From Lukla, it's a two-week trip on foot to base camp. Sherpas, who have traditionally helped the expeditions originating in Nepal, carry the tons of equipment and supplies or load it onto yaks. Well, we had probably 250 or 300 loads, and a porter typically carries one load. Yaks can carry two of those loads. So on a certain day, we might have 100 or 200 porters shuttling loads up into the base camp area. We had a couple of Lieutenant Sherpas who had radios, so they somehow 
kept track of the fact that we left such and such a case in somebody's basement and, and this other case in somebody's kitchen and they were literally scattered all over the Kumbu. In IMAX, the film itself is very heavy. Each minute of film weighs a lot. It's hard to load it with gloves on, so what you have to do is just get everything set up, get the magazine put on, and then you take your gloves off and just thread it as fast as you can and get your gloves back on. That's all you can do. This camera uses six feet of film a second. 500 feet of film loaded into a magazine weighs 10 pounds. For that 10 pounds, you get 90 seconds of film. It just never fails that right when something absolutely perfect is about to happen, we run out of film. I think there are gods up there that, that control that. Yeah, Brad, the problem is if it's a 100% better shot if they're side lit. Mm -hmm. So you really do a lot of thinking before a shot. They still have a rim light on them. Which is fine. I'm ready. We had our exposed footage sent back weekly with yak herders in boxes, and um, we had made a, we had organized the chain of uh, transport to uh, Kathmandu, and from there it went straight to uh, Los Angeles, where it got processed. So we knew the camera was working, but you still didn't get what every cinematographer or director wants, which was to see the images yourself and decide, well, here's how I would reframe it. Base camp, it's at the end of this really, really long valley that dead ends into this huge amphitheater. And coming down into it is this river of ice called the Kumbu Icefall right down on top of base camp. It's like being on the moon, really. It's such a strange environment. There's no green, it's just rock and ice and snow. Each expedition has its own little encampment and there's about two or 300 people there. It's like a little outpost on the moon or something. You have the spectacular view of these Himalayan mountains, but you know, after a few hours, the view's the same all the time. It's hard to walk any place because there's rocks everywhere. You're cold when you go to bed, you're cold when you wake up, and you're cold all during the day. You know, the fact that, you know, we can just go, ah, and take a nice deep breath here. You don't ever get a deep breath at base camp or above. It just doesn't happen. I think it's more about a hot bath, in a bath or in a swimming pool. Mm, that will be better than a hot shower if you can stay and relax. Can you hand me like two of those peanut butter and some of that dried fruit? I want to send that up tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Altogether, we had 11 people on the climbing team and 21 more helping out at base camp. The climbers had to have time to adjust to the high altitude so that their blood could carry more oxygen. There's four camps that we have to establish and that's how you're acclimatizing. If you were to go there from Los Angeles and fly and land at the South Call immediately, I mean, you'd die. I wanted the film to be more, more than just the personal quest, to, to basically take the mountain and try to understand a little bit more about why it's there and how it's changing. The Indian continent, it's crashing into the Tibetan plateau, and so as they crash together, that's what's forcing the Himalayas to form. So Everest is actually rising one or two or three centimeters every year. We worked with scientists to help install a GPS ground station high on Mount Everest to help measure the upward movement of the mountain. The overall goal of our expedition was to document an ascent of Everest in the IMAX format for McGillivray Freeman Freeman Films. What we set out to do was um, get a 42-pound IMAX camera to the top of Everest much bigger than IMAX things. Cameras are quite heavy. And I thought this camera no going to summit. Called it the pig. And it's like schlepping a pig with you all the way to the top of Everest, which people thought couldn't be done. Just lifting the camera up and putting it on the tripod, 
two people doing it, you get it up there and you like that for, you know, three or four minutes, just getting one shot. Everybody then had to go for, take a nap for two hours. It was just so exhausting. People going to the South Coal cut their toothbrushes in half to save weight. We were climbing, but they were climbing and working with the camera, and that's a double work. It's important for people to know that nothing happens on Everest, at least in our type of team, without the heroic efforts of the Sherpas. I don't want anyone to think I was up there carrying that camera around. One Sherpa had the tripod legs and the tripod head, that was Gombu. Another Sherpa had the camera, and that was Lakpa Sherpa. Another Sherpa carried four magazines, which each weighed 10 pounds, and that was Tillan. And there was also Zongbu, and Zongbu carried all the accessories and batteries and other things. But it's not only their strength that's so valuable, it's just their spirit. You'll be tired digging out a tent and one of them will crack a joke and we're all up there just laughing. in the climbing team, these mountaineers, they're shaking hands with death all the time every time they, they climb a mountain. Getting to the summit is half the climb. Getting down is the other half. And I have a saying that getting to the summit is optional, getting down is mandatory. When my father and Hillary went up on top, my father said, Tuji Che, Chomolongma. Thank you very much to the mountain, you know, for, you know, getting him up there. We're at Camp 3, and tomorrow we go to Camp 4, and the next day, hopefully, to Summit. You don't conquer mountains, and you don't assault them. It's impossible. I mean, my attitude is we quietly sneak up there and respectfully sneak down. Tomorrow we will be better day than today. And today have been um, warm enough, but just the last moment has been uh, windy and a little snowy. Everyone's praying, you know, for good weather. We had a satellite phone and I was able to talk directly to David when he was up at about the 25,000 foot level. In Laguna Beach, it was like a summer's day. It was May, it was warm, you know, everyone was out on the beach surfing. And I was getting this call from near the summit of Mount Everest. David was saying that it was minus 20 degrees. And the wind was blowing at 100 miles an hour and he just didn't think that it could be done right then. David's caution was completely correct. Some of the other expeditions on the mountain pushed for the summit despite the threatening weather, and that was when tragedy struck. Leading the news tonight, tragedy on the roof of the world. Climbers lost in mountain storm. People were becoming cavalier about climbing Everest, and there was a lack of respect for the mountain and how powerful and dangerous a place it can be, uh, you know, just like that. We watched them through telescopes and I could see these people backed up at the top and bottom of the Hillary Step way too late. And we were saying, my God, what are these people doing? The first I heard of any trouble was a fellow from uh, Todd Burleson's group came down to our dining tent about 4.30 in the afternoon, he says, well, Rob Hall's in trouble. Ah, uh, some people are going to the summit and coming down with us. Problem. Late, late, late. And then the word comes that there's 17 people that haven't arrived back in Camp 4 from their summit attempt. Well, that was like getting hit in the chest with a 50-pound sledgehammer. It was just the unthinkable that happened. They arrived too late to summit and they return too slow in the wind. In, without oxygen, they lost their way. David had given permission to the people at Camp 4 to break into our tent up there that had all our oxygen supplies and said, take all you need. Just packed the camera away and devoted our attentions to the rescue efforts. We just knew people were missing and we were we were running around from camp to camp trying to figure out, you know, who was missing, making lists. And about 4.45 is when we got the call from Rob saying, you know, is anyone coming to get me? Only Rob Hall have the radio. Rob Hall, say, I'm stay resting here. You come tomorrow morning, bring the oxygen. I'm stay here resting. 
to Teil. I called Ed and said, you know, get on the radio with Rob. Tell him to, to get his butt moving just to help himself. Only take what you need, Rob. Only take what you need and start moving. Talking to Rob on the radio was very difficult, knowing that there wasn't anything I could do. He was at least two days away. Uh, even if we were to leave right away, we, were, we wouldn't reach him for two days. We at one point thought he was moving. You know, We thought he was trying to get himself up and, and as far as he could, but that wasn't the case, and we didn't find that out until about an hour and a half, two hours later that you know, he said, you know, I haven't even left yet. We knew that was it for Rob, that he couldn't survive another night. And then they'd reach Scott, and we heard Scott was dead. And then Namba and Beck were dead. You know, I became virtually certain that I was dead, almost like I was just floating along the, the surface of the ice, and then I drifted away. Beck's kind of a miracle, and Beck's also a mystery. It's a miracle he survived, and it's a mystery. I could see my family before me, and I knew that if I did not get up, I was going to spend eternity there. And I had a lot to live for. And I, I might not make it, but I wasn't going to go down easy. <laughs> it was a wonderful moment because out of all this uh, tragedy uh, had come this little ray of, of hope, you know? Someone had come back from the dead, and it was Beck. They all said he was going to die that night. He was put in a tent and I think left to be looked after by some Sherpas. And he didn't, you know, Beck wasn't ready to die yet. And at this point, the IMAX guys had come up, David Brashears and Ed Veaster and Robert Shower, and they were putting their film at risk and help. I pretty much assembled the dream team of climbing. You know, I'll never forget it. I was in front of him placing his feet. His eyes were swollen shut from the frostbite. We were just talking the whole way down and he was cracking jokes. Remember at one point we got singing on that and we started singing Chain of Fools. <laughs> My wife was told that I was dead and there was no doubt. And a few hours later, the word came down that no, I wasn't dead. I'd come into camp, but I was critically injured. And so that at this point, uh, what was uh, a wake became a group of power moms trying to figure out what they could do. If, they, if they'd been aware of what they were asking, they would have known it was futile, but they sought somebody who would be willing to try such a rescue. A woman who worked in the embassy and said, I know a man, Colonel Madon KC, who has always believed that he has a brave heart, but has never been given the chance to to find out for sure whether that's true. So I said, okay, I'll go. I'm not 100% because we have not been that valley before and that is a very, very dangerous one because we always have the high wind up there. I said to the American embassy, we'll try, just we'll try. I didn't believe it for a second. <laughs> They'd never been done and I frankly didn't think that there was any likelihood once somebody took a look at what it would take to put a helicopter down in there that they would really follow through. And suddenly, whenever he went above the crevasse, the ground effect dropped and he uh, got his tail really dangerously deep. He could feel that, of course, and he took the helicopter away as soon as he could. Thought, okay, this is a smart man. <laughs> He's not gonna do this. Uh, he came back again brought the helicopter in, he's alone. The margin of error is absolutely zero. Any mistake is fatal for him. And he places that thing down so softly, it's like a feather settling onto the snow. I said only one person at a time, they said two. They brought down another climber, Mac Lou Gal. It was clear that the helicopter's there to pick me up. I mean, you want to survive these things, but you've got, you, you've got to come through it with, with some sense that you've behaved well, that you've done the right thing. I gave up the, the position I had to him and they took off. I was pretty sure they'd never come back. In about five minutes, we all stood there and nobody really said anything. And then you could hear way down below, 
sound of those rotors as they claw their way up the side of that cliff. I jumped in the back of it and he just leaned the helicopter forward and we just roll off the edge of the ice fall and dive. When we saw that the helicopter is going down the base cave, it's just lying backwards and, and got emotional is such an, uh, in a, in a uh, I can't describe it. When he did this, there was no sense that people were gonna notice this. He just did it because it was the right thing to do. And I think he, I think he did it because he does have a brave heart. If Beck had died, things may have been different for some of us, but seeing him come down and have the spirit he had, it was a very, you know, reassuring thing. Those three weeks in May for me, even though I was in Laguna Beach, were probably the most stressful weeks I'd ever experienced. The tragedy had hit everyone really hard, and so the team went back to base camp to regroup and to think. They weren't sure whether or not they wanted to go back up. They decided to give it some time. It was not afraid for me because um, they had different style to climb and I believed my team, I trusted my, our Sherpas, I trusted my leader, he would give right decision so I had not so big afraid but I was too sorry for them so I was very sad. We were left with a bit of a ghost town and, and with a graveyard above the South Coal. I think the hard part will be knowing that they're up there and that we'll have to go past their bodies. Well I don't like climb a route with people that on the way. I'm afraid of cross that people and frozen see them. I don't like. That's all. It is depressing, you know, especially for us in the Sherpa culture to, to see dead people, you know, but uh, at least we try to avoid not to look at it. You know, it's uh, not a good sign. It's hard to change gears from everything that had happened to, you know, doing it all over again in a way. I went down the valley for a couple days and walked in the grass and smelled the flowers. And, you know, there was life down below and green. And I mean, the green is so unbelievably vibrant after being at base camp for that amount of time. Came back and I was, I was pretty ready to get rolling with this and, and get our expedition completed. I could give them no other reason to go back up Everest except you're here, we're fit, we're strong, we won't make those mistakes, and let's go if, if, we, if we still want to climb Everest. Anyone climbing high on the slopes of Everest, 27, 28,000 feet, is in a very hypoxic state. Your brain simply is not getting enough oxygen. Death zone is anywhere from 24,000 feet up. There's just not enough oxygen. There's nothing that lives up there permanently. You get into the South Coal at maybe 5 p.m. You collapse into your sleeping bag. By 9 p.m., you're up. You haven't slept. I couldn't sleep. I was really a bit worried. I thought maybe I went too far. Maybe I'm too old already. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not strong enough for that. And so I was wondering, you know, did I still have it in me, physically, mentally, that type of thing. So I really built it up as this huge thing. Sumio had some problems with her ribs, a lot of coughing. Uh, my rib, one, one is cracked, so three weeks before, and I think another one is three, four days before. So. It's painful to have it in the night, especially or when I cough it. But I don't think it, and I can, I can forget. When it came time for her to go to the summit, I had to make a very, very hard decision and a heartbreaking one. 
um, to crawl into her tent at 26,000 feet and say, uh, Sumio, you can't go. It was very, very clear in my mind there was a graveyard above us on that mountain, partially due to the fact that people who shouldn't have been allowed to go up high were allowed to go up high. Since I was climbing without oxygen, everybody figured that I would be climbing slower. So I left at 11 o'clock at night, and they left at midnight, thinking that by the time the sun came up and by the time the filming would start, they would have caught up to me. Because it had been 13 days since anyone had tried to climb, the trails were all packed in with snow. So he had to break through on his own, um, sometimes three or four feet of snow. But with Ed, he just has this ability to climb at high altitude that goes beyond other people's ability. Once I got climbing, I had a great day. I broke trail all day. It was the best, strongest day I've ever had in the mountains. Yeah, just getting up, you know, going one ridge, and I'm like, okay, the summit must be there. So you go up another ridge, okay, no summit. <laughs> You're tired at that point, and it's not easy to keep your spirit up. But you are almost there, and you want to try it. Just try it. The five Sherpas who helped the climbing team up the mountain on the summit day were responsible for carrying most of the heavyweight equipment. It took 12 hours to get all the way to the top of the mountain. We could not have made this film without their spirit and their strength these are the heroes of the expedition. When I saw it, I was just like so happy, you know, just thrilled. Uh, David was there. David said, yes, you're here, you know, this is it. And I went and just hugged him and cried. And in a very, very touching, really emotional moment for me, being on top with this man who, 43 years earlier, an image of his father on this mountain where we were standing at that moment had started me off dreaming about climbing. I just said some prayers up there, thanking the mountain, and then prayed to my father. I repeated what he had done. I put a picture of both my father and my mother and left a picture of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, too. I don't think I've ever been that emotional, ever. To capture this incredible moment, the camera crew had only one chance and only 90 seconds of film. They had to load the camera in sub-zero temperatures, barehanded. Every second of film is in the movie. Brad called me from base camp on the satellite phone and said, they've made it, I can't believe it. And I said, oh my God, I, I can't believe it either. They had so much courage and, and perseverance that they willed their way to the top of the mountain. You can't really relax or have this great feeling of joy and because you're still in this tenuous place and something could happen on the way down. But then when you reach the base camp, it's not exactly the moment when you just say, yoo-hoo. <laughs> you give a hug to somebody and you just feel good. Then it's time to party, you know, and have a good time and, and reflect on what you just did. One of the best parts of expeditions is getting back home and just enjoying life and relaxing. And uh, it's, it's been a long three-month expedition and two or three months of planning, so uh, a lot of the stress now is gone, and we can just relax and enjoy uh, our success. But now in here, I feel like at home. It's really nice back the base camp with everything, with all my things, uh, and take a shower. I feel really good. More happy than, than I expect. It's very nice and comforting. And uh, just knowing that, you know, that is the place where my father was once and 43 years later, I'm there too. But it was just an amazing accomplishment and it was something that Ed and David had wanted to do, given what had just recently happened, that if you use your brains up there, if you're patient, you use your experience, 
you can go up and you can do it and you can get back down safely. Plus, we got this ridiculously heavy camera up there. It's hard to believe now that I'm several months past the experience we ever did it. And it worked, as we could see it uh, months later in uh, Laguna Beach at the Gillery Freeman's screening room. I was really in tears when I saw our footage. In that format, it was just like to be there again, right in the scene. Just the wind was missing. The expedition is the central spine of the whole movie, but there are these other elements that we're weaving into the film, having to do with the history of climbing Everest, the geology and the culture of the Himalayas, and also the physiology of what the climbers undergo. As the film has taken shape, it's become clear that we have something very special here. Incredible visuals, plus a very powerful storyline that breaks new ground in IMAX. The film has received remarkable media attention, and Bill Bennett, who's coordinated the film's release, expects it to reach an unprecedented number of people. And we hope that the Everest film will give the audience a sense of the beauty of the mountains and the incredible spirit of the people who climb them.